Nature is something that all of us look at for beauty, for reprieve, but those of us living in the cities never see as intrinsic to our lives. Two days ago, Dayamani Barla made a very impassioned plea for the relationship between tribals and the forests. Today, Pavan Sukhdev, as I've already said, is somebody who's working with the Green Initiative, with Teeb. Pavan was a former banker, and it is very, very heartening when the banking world starts to speak the language of the tribal lady, because more people are likely to listen when a man like him, suited, booted, sitting at the UN, is saying the same things that the woman in Jharkhand is saying. So Pavan, first of all, why are we trying to evaluate nature? You know, you, you, you're trying to put an economic value to nature. Why don't we just close the argument and protect it? Why are we trying to put a value to it? Well, nowadays, economics is the currency of policy. And uh, you, know, you may have the most strong reason from your heart, just as a human being, to value nature. But the reality is that when you approach policymakers, when you approach governments in India, for example, you need to explain and say that, look, this is valuable to local communities. This is valuable to the tribals. This is valuable to the city. You know, if those of you are from Bombay will know that some of your water comes from Burivri National Park. It's a forest. So unless you talk in these terms and demonstrate economic value, your arguments fall flat. That's really why. So does nature have a role to play in uh you know, say in elevating the recession, you know, is it really still something of an emotional uh, value and uh, value to certain communities? Or, you know, when you're evaluating nature, can you demonstrate how it's of economic value to people sitting here? Sure, I mean, well, right here in India, for instance, we have the NREGA, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, and uh, part of that scheme is, is all about providing communities and villages outside of growing season 100 rupees per day for 100 days to do largely earthworks, earthworks which will restore the local e ecosystem. So you get soil fertility back, you get fresh water back. And it seems to have succeeded, not only just providing employment, therefore there are millions actually, something like 30 million I heard, are actually provided temporary employment, which is great at a time of recession. But also, nature provides soil fertility, it provides fresh water. You know, there are places, uh, for instance, where cotton has started growing again. Um, Hewere Bazaar, it's a village in Maharashtra, not far actually from Vidarbha, where those farmer suicides have taken place. It's known as a millionaire's village. Uh, I mean rupee millionaires, not dollar millionaires, of course. And that's because the soil fertility has come back to such an extent, doing these earthworks, that the crop yields have really increased. And finally, you have a successful rural economy. You know, but uh, Pavan, Yesterday, Stuart was talking about putting the voice of the planet into business strategy. The question I was asking, I mean, it's understandable to agricultural communities, to tribal communities, to corporations. You know, uh, what is the value of nature for corporations? Why should they care to protect it? You know, yeah. uh, I remember once when we were talking, you said, they f we forget to compute the fact that electricity, all of that is, is coming out of water, and you gave oh, me this, some wonderful yeah. figure for... Uh, how much actually corporations should value nature. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, uh, the irony is, and I keep saying this, that you know, we use nature all the time, whether it's clean air or fresh water, or whether it's nutrients uh, flowing from the functions of forests into the soils and providing soil fertility, or whether it's ecotourism, or whether it is bioprospecting. Basically, when you go searching for molecules in rainforests or in reefs, 60% of the world's medicines actually come from these sources. So it's only when you found the molecules, then you take them to the factories and manufacture your drugs. So all this is valuable to business. These are what businesses are about. And frankly, everything that, is, that we consume begins from something that is either dug out of the soil or grown from the soil. All business is basically about these things. So business is by definition interested in this, has to be. Now the question is, are they enjoying a free lunch? Is the food and the minerals coming to them at a price which isn't properly taxed, isn't properly evaluated? Um, these are the issues that we have to discuss, and this is where we have to get the policy guys in, involved as well. There, there was another uh, wild statistic that I read, which was that this global recession, um, the financial yeah. meltdown on Wall Street, cost, I think, the U.S. two and a half trillion dollars. Not just the U.S., that was the G20 economies, yeah, that was the... Okay, uh, Wall, and, Wall and, and, and that city. just yeah. the loss of forests, that there's a figure to that. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. No, in fact, the, uh, the size of these losses. So, you know, the thing, about, the thing about nature is that a lot of what you get from nature is, is valuable, and you value it because 
it's all these good things that you get. But you value it, and yet you use it up. Yeah? You, you sort of use it as if it's free, and that's the, that's the challenge. Now, of course, you can find out how much it would it cost you, for instance, if you didn't have the nutrients and fresh water flowing from the, uh, the forest through the waters into the aquifers, into the fields, and your production of wheat and rice had gone down. You can find out how much that costs. Right? Or if you didn't have the forest for ecotourism, you could find out how much that costs. Or if, God forbid, you didn't have forest for fuel wood. Today, more than 40% of our cooking fuel in India comes from forests, right? You can find out how much charcoal you'd have to pay for. So you can find out the dollar values or rupee values of stuff that you get for free. And if you work out the rate at which you are losing all of these values, you end up on a global statistic on a number of something like two to four trillion dollars. That's huge. So that's as big as the uh, the. Yeah, I, I suppose yeah. it would make us sit up if we realize you're losing four trillion. What was it? Four, four trillion dollars. Four, four trillion million, dollars, million dollars a year yeah. by just yeah. cutting forests. Cutting you know? forests, spoiling waters, and so on. Yeah. And we we pump money back into the financial markets, but not yeah. into the forest division. You know. I mean, it. it I, I was when I was in the bank. Um, I was always puzzled as to you know, like we are losing trillions of dollars in nature. Never once does it capture headlines. And yet, every time there's another bank that hits the, hits the ceiling, whether it's a Lehman's or, or, a, or whoever, oh my god, headlines everywhere. Tell me, Pavan, there's a great anxiety. <laughs> there is some anxiety in the environmental uh, circuit that if you put a price to nature, I understand what you're saying, that we must put a value to nature, an economic value, if you're going to be able to, you know, it's largely what Nicholas Stern did to the climate change debate. He moved it from the scientific community into the economic conversation, and that's when the world really sat up and listened. So I understand the impulse of what you're doing, you know, to put a, put a value figure to nature. But there is an anxiety that if you put a value to it, then you'll be able to trade in it. You know, so for instance, if, if, I, if you say POSCO is bringing X billion dollars or million dollars of uh, GDP growth or investment into India, and the forests of Orissa is only valued at you know, half that, uh, half that million, uh, that then POSCO will legitimize its presence in Orissa. How are we going to get around that? Firstly, what you raise is a very valid concern, because you know, the, the whole problem is you can't monetize everything. And uh, in fact, valuation is a human institution. Valuation is, is like the ability to have taxation, the ability to have laws and order. Valuation is of that caliber, of that cadre, if you like. And as a human institution, it can be applied just by society. I mean, there are, uh, there are sacred groves. In, in India, there are tens of thousands of sacred groves. There's no money applied to that. I mean, people's lives, people's beliefs are attached to those groves, and they will defend them with their lives if you try to take them away. And that's what happened, for example, in, in Niamgari, in, in Orissa, right? The point is, who should value? How should it be valued? And the first point to understand with valuation is that it is a human institution. It is human beings who value. And if the tribals are there, and their value for that piece of land is infinity, then I'm afraid that's the value that you've got to accept. Uh, s some years ago, I'd, I'd done a, you know, when uh, the Home Minister P. Chidamram was the Finance Minister at that time, I'd done an interview with him, and I said, what is the government's vision, and what is your, his personal vision for India? And he said, because you know, we were talking about mining, and he said, what do you want? Do you want all those minerals to stay in Mother Earth? And do you want these people to just be hunter-gatherers? And I said, what's your vision? And he said, uh, we are working to bring 85% of India into urban centers. Uh, I want to understand, Pavan, is that a good policy? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, um, OK, so firstly, let's frame this. I mean, I appreciate where he's coming from. The point is that. Urbanization is a global trend. We are already 50% past the 50% uh, global urbanization level. China is at 51%. India is 30%, but we'll head towards 50 in, I would imagine, the foreseeable future. Right? So we are 1.1 billion today. Just do the maths. That means if we are 30%, that means 330 million are basically living in villages. Now, according to the Planning Commission, we're going to grow by 2026 to 1.4 billion. Right? So if we become 700 million in villages only by, uh, sorry, but in, in towns, I don't mean villages. So we go from cities, 330 million to 700 million. 
you've increased 370 million people in cities. That's just growing to 50% based on the government's own forecast. That's the Planning Commission forecast for 15 years forward in 2026. 370 million more people in cities. The population of Bombay is 18 million. That's 20 more Bombays being added to India's cities in 15 years. I mean, that's staggering, right? So we have to see what is possible. So, Pavan, what's the answer? I mean, whenever we, we bring up this, you know, we are told that it's a historic inevitability, this yes. move towards urbanization, and that it's not plausible to keep people in the countryside, uh, and, you know, that you can't bring health services, you can't bring education, and that agriculture is a lost cause, you know, so... Uh, <laughs> well, I'll say a few things to that. Firstly, agriculture is not a lost cause. It employs two-thirds of India, right? And I know it doesn't produce more than 17% of GDP, but the fact is employment matters. Jobs matter, right? If you have another 370 million people in India's cities by 2026, that's 15 years from now, that means finding jobs from them. And if on top of the existing job growth that is already a challenge, you have this happening as well, this migration from the village to cities, what are you going to do? I mean, are you going to have 370 million people manufacturing Ferraris? So you have to focus on the village. You have to focus on the village economy. You have to recognize that, yes, of course, migration will ha take place between the village and the city. But the solution to India can't just be an industrialized model. And I think that's really important to recognize, that the village economy and its agricultural economy needs to be focused on, needs to be improved, so that wealth flows into the hands of the villagers. And it cannot be a one-shot solution. So. Uh, does, does that necessarily, you know, we're always told that the land holdings in India are too small and that it's not profitable and that it's going to keep getting worse at, as, as land fractures more. So is the small farm a viable uh, uh, economic project? Today, today, and that's the sad thing, I feel that we are making the small farmer unviable. So first, let me quickly draw from a global study that, that we made use of as part of our report, the Green Economy Report. And uh, that was a study done in 2006. It covered about 385 schemes around the world, almost 12 million farms, across 57 developing countries. And they found that by using ecologically friendly methods, which means low tillage farming, or reusing farm water, or using farm manure, or changing your crop species so that they don't all fall prey to the same crop pests, and so on and so forth, and multi-cropping. These are just common sense things that farmers do. Just these practices across these many millions of farms increase yields by 79% on average. Right? And on top of that, another FAO study came a couple of years ago, which said actually it's even higher. So the point is, success is about yields. Now just bear one thing in mind, that there's other work that we have done which shows that a 10% increase in farm yields means in South Asia, that means India and Southeast Asia, will improve the poverty situation. It will reduce poverty by 5%. So every 10% increase in farm yields reduces poverty 5%. Can you imagine what an extra 79% would do if only we followed that logic? It would bring wealth in the hands of the poor. That's what you want. In fact, I, I, like nature, I think what we don't value is food production. You know, I think in too much of our economic debates and in, you know, in all our public discourse, when we talk food security, it's always the corporatization of, uh, of food, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, again, a, another fascinating statistic is that 50% of at least India's food production is from the uh, unplanned and the, and the small farmer sector. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, India is not alone. I mean, the, at a global level, and this is what I find remarkable, is that I think some of the, uh, the pride that today's top four seed companies and the top ten fertilizers companies display in their, in their footprint is unjustified because 60% of the food that is grown on Earth is actually grown in 525 million small farms. And out of those 525 million, 400 million of the small farms are less than two hectares, which means subsistence farming. So yeah, the India statistic is actually very much the global story as well in that sense. That's where food is being grown. Why can't we focus on improving food's yield where it is grown rather than trying to keep you know, injecting the additional pesticides, fertilizers, and destroying soil fertility in the process. Pavan, uh, you know, Bjorn Lomborg was saying we can spend our money better, and you're another green prophet who's saying we should shift to the green economy. Could you just spell out sure. what is the green economy? 
yeah, the green economy is, is many things, to be honest. It's uh, using nature better is part of the green economy. In other words, recognizing, demonstrating, and capturing the value of nature. That's part of it, but that's not all. Because the green economy is about focusing on the efficiency of energy use, the efficiency of materials usage. Obviously, recognizing nature and using nature, if you like, and its flows more intelligently. And at the same time, focusing on a few key areas like renewable energy uh, and waste management and ecotourism and tourism generally, they have huge footprints. So these are the areas which need to be focused on, and, and especially cities, because uh, whether we ever achieve 85% or, or, God forbid, in a, in a way that doesn't work, uh, the fact is we are going to achieve 50% at some point, and you need to focus on the city and the way energy and materials are used in the city, how you transport, it, how you transport people in the city. So these are some of the aspects of the green economy which are focused on. And what we are saying is that it is possible to show globally as well as in most countries that by picking a mix of all these sectors, you can actually manage an economy with better levels of production per unit of energy or per unit of materials used. You know, we spoke about employment. I think um, I, he's not in the audience, so it's not fair for me to keep quoting him. But when uh, Mr. Chidamram was the finance minister, in fact, it was interesting, he was opposed to the SEZ Act because he said there had been very low employment growth uh, in India. And I just want to come back to this issue of employment. You mentioned some ways, for instance, that we have to focus on the small farmer. It's, sub it's sustainable living, it's subsistence living, but it adds to the well-being of the world. But uh, there's also job creation in protecting nature, isn't sure. there, in terms of uh, water management? Could, could you just Soil talk management, about... management, water management, and some of the technologies. I mean, uh, many of your speakers have talked about technology at the bottom of the pyramid. This morning, Sam, Sam Petroda mentioned that part of the idea of his his uh, catalog, if you like, of 11,000 plants, was obviously to recognize that these are valuable and to see what can be done with them. But let me give you another example of technology. Amongst the problems of food, and you know, people keep asking me, oh, how can we feed 9 billion people in 2050? And I always shoot back to them, why aren't you feeding 10 billion people today? Because we are growing enough food for 10 billion, it's just that 30% of it is wasted, one way or the other, 10% on the fields, 10% transporting down to the, the market, because of storage losses largely, and 10% actually thrown in waste paper baskets. Um, where I live these days in the US, that number is 40%, by the way. And hopefully in India, because we are taught to eat everything by our mothers usually, uh, we don't throw as much. But on average, it's still 10%. This waste is pointless, and it can be reduced. So that's uh, one focus, uh, frankly. But also the other side of this focus is, is recognizing that you need to capture these values. For instance, storage. It costs only a few thousand rupees to buy steel canisters this big, which will provide enough storage. And of all the places I've seen, there are 17 countries where uh, the FAO had done this program. In Afghanistan, would you believe, they managed to increase the price at which farmers sell maize from about $14 per, per quintal to $40 per quintal, just by storing it from the time it is harvested to the time that you get the better price in the marketplace. Today, because we don't have that storage, that's simple, a few thousand rupees of steel canister, that's all you need, bottom of the, tech, bottom of the pyramid technology. If you don't have that, then the poor farmer, once again, is not getting the best price for what he's growing. And who's getting it is actually whoever has the money to store, intermediary, in other words. Why would you want that? Why not provide that technology? Just imagine the jobs in creating small, simple solutions like that. Microfinance them, bring that technology in, and yes, yields will improve and price realizations will improve, once again, helping the poor farmer. You know, uh, Pavan, just to again uh, show the possibilities of all this, <clears throat> in an earlier conversation uh, we were having in Delhi, uh, you'd mentioned that apart from the, the good that will come to the individual on the ground, yeah. that there's a, I forget the f figure, but it's some billion dollar industry in just the green e economy in retrofitting and so oh, yeah, should, yeah. could we just talk a little yeah. bit about that? Well, that what are the business potential yeah. of this? Right. So let's just give you some of the ideas in, in the green economy. And green economy, of course, means using technology, using innovation, and pushing innovation, in fact, pushing the boundaries of innovation. Um, especially in Europe, and to an extent in any cities, in, in India as well, you can actually retrofit buildings to sometimes half or even one-fourth their, their quarter, their energy demands. And the savings will usually justify that, that investment. And there are also opportunities in uh, improving transportation, making better transportation for the public, and that tends to usually add jobs, and it also tends to provide some GDP kicker as well. 
Um, there are opportunities aplenty in, in looking at renewables technology, and India, of course, is doing quite well in that. Um, there are opportunities in microfinance. There, as I mentioned, agricultural microfinance is something we haven't developed very well. We can, if we focus on it, and so on. Okay, Pavan, before the last bell rings, just to touch on water, uh, uh, you know, we've spoken about agriculture and all of that, but uh, what is the value of water? And uh, what is the work and thinking that is happening around water? Well, water has uh, got two broad aspects, the upstream and the downstream. Upstream means manage the watershed better, get more water in, and the downstream is be more efficient in its use. I mean, today, almost uh, half the water that flows from the source to the agricultural point where it is used is lost. So improving investment in canal infrastructure uh, and building dams and reservoirs along the way, I think these, these are all activities which make a huge difference. And I think we have to do better, frankly. Um, there was a study by McKinsey and others which suggested that India's gap between water supply and demand, if we did nothing, would actually widen to a point where it was 50% shortage of water. So we can't clearly run with that, especially with an economy with more people, more agriculture, and so on. And I think we have to focus on that. But I once again point out that you know, we need to look to where it's needed. It's basically at the farm level. And uh, it's very important to focus on nature in summary, I'll say this, because we forget how much value comes from the forests and, and the waters into the fields. We forget it, and when we remember it as economists, we tend to say, okay, well, it's like 15 or 20% of GDP. It's not, it's not. You need to look at who benefits, the farmer benefits. Flood prevention, drought control. If you have floods and droughts, the poor farmer suffers. If you don't have forests, it's the poor farmer's wife that can't go in and collect fuel wood for cooking. If you don't have the forest there, then it's the poor farmer's cattle and goats who can't go in and feed off the leaf litters. He's the one who can't harvest tendupatta. He's the one who can't get other things from the forest to the cell. If you look at all that, the value of all that stuff that comes to the, to the poor rural household is almost 50% of their total livelihood. So don't look at GDP, please. Look at the GDP of the poor, and then ask, how much is nature, nature as a fraction of the GDP of the poor? It's come. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to uh, wrap up with saying that Pavan has been fighting this battle. It's an unusual uh, experience for a banker of his stature to be talking from the periphery. But uh, his persistence has paid. India has done six, six states have uh, taken on his pilot project, and the TEAB has been adopted by six states. We are starting to do a green index of the value of forests and rivers and ecosystems uh, in the country. And uh, recently, I think just barely two days ago, the, the economist asked, uh, Pavan to write a piece for it. So these ideas are beginning to become mainstream and change is afoot. And uh, Pavan is on to another very big project called Corporations 2020, where he is forecasting and describing how corporations must reinvent themselves. But he pleaded with me that that's a conversation we must save for next year. So thank you so much. Thank you.